compassion therapy. Oh. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> You're you on a different play. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering <laughs> around. Yeah, Instagram is annoying. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Way! Hi, Sarah. Hi, can you hear me, Yeah! <laughs> I'm just going to have to like, duck in. I, I love this double layer of tech we have yeah. going on here. This is fabulous. <laughs> I can see you on the camera. I can see you on the computer. Yeah, I saw you joined. <laughs> Amazing. Great. Well, we're just having some more people joining us at the moment. So we'll just let give people a couple of minutes. Um, but how are you both? Yeah, good. Yeah, just had busy days at work. So yeah, just getting in the mending mindset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Same. I've got my socks still here. Oh, nice. <laughs> what did you go for um, using as a... I've gone for a pestle. Oh, nice. Yeah, I quite like that one the best out of the ones it's that I've got. It's weight to it. Yeah. That's a good a size nice sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll make a start and I will just do a little intro for anyone that has never seen me before and doesn't know what this is. So, hello everyone, welcome for joining us and welcome, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Rosanna and I am a volunteer with Woodfield Pavilion, which is a community centre uh, based on Tooting Common in South London. And um, if you haven't heard of us before, the pavilion is run by a charity called the Woodford Project, of which I am also a trustee. And we aim to develop the pavilion as a centre for local communities and schools to share in culture, health, well-being and to champion sustainability and the natural environment of uh, Tooting Commons. So I've been volunteering with Woodfield since the start of this year and have been trying at least to run a regular sewing session with them. So I started running it, running it every month at the pavilion. And then during lockdown, I ran them. Oh, virtually. This is my setup, dodgy setup as well. <laughs> the home um, setup. Ran them virtually. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's just like, yeah, if you could see my setup right now. Be... <laughs> so during lockdown, I tried to run them, um, every two weeks virtually because no one you know none of us had much to do and it was nice to have that sort of community um woodfield started a cook-along series on instagram live where chefs around the globe would uh cook a dish and people would join like you are now and follow along and i'm really interested in taking this idea and creating a stitch along series with video tutorials and chats with inspiring makers. So in August, I spoke to Emily Rowan about her amazing Stitch Therapy Club, um, which you can watch on Woodfield's IGTV. And tonight I am joined by the wonderful Eleanor and Sarah of the fabulous Fast Fashion Therapy. So hello. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. <laughs> And we have Sarah uh, on Zoom and live, which we're just so tech savvy, obviously. <laughs> but being sensible and it's a socially distanced way of doing stuff. No traveling involved. So that's a good yeah. thing. And I actually came across you guys, across Fast Fashion Therapy, during uh, Stretton Festival last October, so nearly a year ago. And but I've been following you on social media ever since, and I can't wait to hear more about how it came to be and what you're up to and what you've been up to. But just before we kick off, if anyone in uh, the chat or watching has any questions at any point, please do put them in the comments and I'll try my best to relay them. Um, and just to say as well as chatting tonight, we will be doing some live mending. So as, as I said, I have my sock here with my pestle. Um, if you don't have a darning mushroom, which most people probably don't, you can use various things that we will go through later on. And Fast Passion Therapy have an amazing blog all about the things you can use at home instead of the darning mushroom. So, Eleanor and Sarah, it would be great if you could just introduce yourself 
and tell us a bit more about yourself, like who you are, where you're based right now, what your history is, what you studied maybe, like how, how you got to this point, basically. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Eleanor um, and I'm based in London now in Streatham uh, as well. And I basically have studied textiles since like school and kind of just always sewn and yeah, been kind of practical in that way, like since I was a teenager. Um, and I kind of came into doing these workshops in repair and kind of encouraging sustainability because uh, I studied textiles as my BA. And then after that was working like more in the industry in London in like a mix of fashion and interiors and it's kind of working in industry and a bit of like the research I did on my BA that led me to kind of think more about sustainability and kind of realise how bad the problem is in the industry in terms of like waste and just the kind of disregard for like the fabrics that we're using and like that whole side of it and so I went to an MA at Chelsea in London and that was kind of where I got more into repair as a, like a tool for kind of everyone being able to have an opportunity to be more sustainable. Because obviously a lot of the time sustainability or like sustainable fashion brands can be quite expensive and repair yeah. seems like a really good tool and like practical way of dealing with this like huge problem that everyone can kind of have a go at and that you don't need that much equipment for to be able to just like keep your clothes going a little bit longer. Yeah. Amazing. And Sarah, what about you? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I I did fashion design at college, but a really long time, I straight out of school, so it was a long time ago. Um, and really, from a really young age, I just always liked my own clothes. And I, I suppose I was already doing sustainable, you know, like upcycling things without even thinking about it. Like, I remember cutting up my mum's old leather jacket, making a bag and all things like that. But I didn't really have a name for it. I just, you know, used whatever I had around. Yeah. Um, and then from college, I went into retail. So I went to be a buyer. Um, but I kind of, I probably there about 10 years and then got a little bit disillusioned with the retail industry and end up doing some like PA work. And it was really then, I ended up doing a PA job sort of back in retail um, and working with a lot of sort of textile designers. And um, and it was, uh, I'll just say it's a popular floral company um, and they were really into vintage. So it kind of inspired me to start up my own sort of vintage business. And from that, um, I was in interest in history and, you know, if I, if I managed to pick up some vintage clothes that were damaged, I didn't want to throw them away. It was all about preserving them. So I would start to mend them and I'd want to kind of make them look really neat so that, you know, these people, when people sort of bought them off me, that, you know, they looked neat. And it got into it that way, really. And it, I just started thinking, oh, you know, if you, I think I started realising that people, other people weren't able to sew. Because I sort of was taught by my nan and could you know, so from a young age, I just assumed everyone was the same. And then when I realised that it wasn't like that, that's when I thought I'd really like to teach people to mend their clothes so they're not, you know, throwing them away. Hmm. Um, so it, it just happened that I'd applied to the, the charity Bethnal Green to use their workspace, and Eleanor did at the same time. Um, we both, uh, our classes were the same. So they suggested that we collaborate which has been great it's been two years now so it's been really good oh amazing so you were actually sort of brought together by someone else sort of recommending that you collaborate is that right yeah so we yeah we both started a separate workshop uh, basically within like a couple of weeks of each other at the create place which is yeah like charity in Bethnal green and they were just yeah mm. said you both interested in the same things and obviously wanting to run it in a similar way and kind of choosing this like charity space so brought us together and yeah it's been two years since then so that's where the little mix wow, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 mm -hmm. and how what made you choose the name fast fashion therapy because i think it's a very unique and specific name it has it has like a sort of specific um I guess it's like a specific thing you're trying to communicate with it. It's not just like mending and repairing. There's like a specific thing that you're trying to tackle. So I'm, bit, I'm, more, I'm interested in like how you came up with that name and 
also like why the word therapy as well and why that's important to you both yeah um so i guess i came up with the name when i was thinking of starting uh the workshop because i think i yeah just want to kind of communicate that it was a sewing workshop focused on like moving away like sustainability and kind of that that problem of like within fast fashion with the name and I guess like to kind of make it stand out in that way from maybe like other workshops um but also because it was kind of the, the idea of therapy was kind of two different like sides of it in the sense that it was a, like a practical space to be like to create a kind of uh therapy from our like addiction to fast fashion and then also to actually act as kind of a mindfulness space in the sense that just sewing and sitting down together as a group can act as a form of therapy for a lot of people as well mm -hmm. amazing yeah, I had the, um, and then, uh, it's the class that we were doing first and I, I really liked it but for me um when I had a break after um being a bio I actually trained to be a homeopath um, so for me, the, it was really interesting the kind of the link between the therapy of something like a conference of homeopathy and really seeing the healing through sewing. And when you you see, especially people hand sewing in the group, you can really see the mindfulness and um, and just really like the, the chats that people have and just as a group can kind of you know talk to each other and um, even especially in lockdown where we've been doing Zoom classes like you have with yours you can see that you know it was a really nice way for people to connect and talk about um sewing and mending and um go with chapter shops or whatever we talk about it was really nice yeah great and i, I want to go deeper into that but first i want to strip it back because there'll be people watching that have never heard of you so just run us through like what you do you've been talking about doing your workshops but just a bit more information about what you do what's on your website things like that so people sort of have an understanding of like what you offer um from fast fashion therapy yeah so we yeah started with the workshops which are our original ones were just um a workshop that people could drop into uh with like any clothes or textiles that they have that needed mending or altering and the space that we work in just has kind of all the equipment um including like sewing machines and just like sewing kit like scissors and needles and spare materials and and yarns and thread and stuff that people need to kind of get going with mending so that there's not like a barrier in terms of like buying the equipment and yeah mm -hmm. it. um and it's quite like a communal space normally um <laughs> which might change a little bit but <laughs> yeah <laughs> in the past it's been you know we sat around a big table with like right. 13 of us just all sharing like ideas and and kind of collaborating on what we're doing and as much as we're there to give advice it's also kind of you know other people come who have got way more experience in certain things than us and so it's very like collaborative in that way mm -hmm. um and then yeah so we built up from there running workshops around the rest of London as well so we were doing them a lot of clothes swaps um and different kind of events around London so like in galleries um and in universities and just kind of taken it on the road around london basically um and then it's kind of just developed a bit more over lockdown that we've built up our blog online um which kind of has a lot of different videos and how to blog posts on different like mending techniques to help people with mending and altering stuff at home mm -hmm. um yeah i think that's about it <laughs> I think um, just before lockdown, we'd started to work on a project to try and encourage um, more men into the class. We only got like one or two. Um, so we started, we did like a survey and we started to kind of take things right back to basics. So actually, one of our most popular videos is um, how to start on the button. Um, so even though like, some people come to the class and want to, you know, change it, pair of trousers and their waistcoat into a jacket um we also want to make sure that that it's accessible to everyone so if you don't have to sign a button it's absolutely fine and we can help people do that too yeah no that's amazing and yeah you raise a really interesting point actually about it's the same the same with things like my workshops and things like that it's um 
yeah, it's heavily gendered and it's it tends to be women that get involved. Um, and I guess the irony for me is like, I guess the things that I normally come to you with is stuff that my boyfriend needs fixing. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll try, I'll try and do that for you. But it's just like, hold on, maybe I should just actually encourage him to learn those skills himself. Um, and yeah, I'm interested in, because you mentioned that, you know, you have the equipment um, readily available for people and this sort of idea of accessibility as well, not just from, you know, having the space and having the kit, but also, um, it's quite a big question, I suppose, but like the barriers to things like mending and upcycling and what you have found might like works for people I guess maybe that is it's to do with the therapy and creating this sort of like well-being space that isn't actually to do necessarily with an output but maybe more about like the process of it and just like enjoying that process rather than you know wanting to get to the finish line do you think that does that sound about right yeah I think that's definitely part of it like we definitely encourage the idea that your men hasn't got to be like this perfect idea, like that people are coming in and it, like the idea of perfect isn't really a thing as well in itself. It's just something that's kind of been created by someone else. Like if it works and if you're like happy with how it looks, then that's, that's good enough and you've got it done and you don't need to put a kind of pressure on yourself to make it look like it did before. Mm -hmm. And like, that's why we kind of encourage a lot of like visible mending because then you can kind of really, play around with your mend being like an extra bit of decoration or like a bit of texture and it doesn't matter if it's a bit more uneven or, and all that kind of thing um so it really I think helps people who are like beginner sewers to feel a bit more confident to like play around with it yeah because uh, a lot of it I think does come from people are told I don't know like if you're not good at a creative thing in school or whatever then you just kind of give it up and it's then kind of stops you from like having so many practical skills like in your adult life because you're just like oh I'm not going to make money out of it or I'm not going to make a job out of it kind of thing but yeah. it's just like it's useful for you to live and you know to like share things with other people so I think it's like really about building up people's confidence in the workshop more than anything so that they just feel like they can play around with it a bit more yeah definitely definitely and it's definitely like you said about the process and it's it's something that i've really just learned recently in lockdown is you know more especially um not so much mending but with dressmaking i always you know i don't rush to get it finished it's always about the finished end product but actually i've kind of read a few different books and i think just having more time in lockdown to work on things that it's made me appreciate the process and mm. you know what that kind of it just takes you away from your computer, from your phone. You know, you're doing something that you have to use your brain for and, um, and you're learning a new skill. Um, and sewing or mending is always about learning a new skill. You yeah. Know, how many years you can do it, there's always something new to learn. Um, so I think that's a really important part, kind of going back to the therapy process, but also enjoying the process of it and not just being about the, like Ellen said, like the perfect finish. Yeah. And how has you know what you've been up to changed since lockdown both you know as fast fashion therapy but your own um you know artist practice and and things like that like how has it changed for you um well in terms of uh, i guess fast fashion therapy we've kind of obviously had to adapt to not being able to see people so just <laughs> <laughs> like more of the stuff online and finding ways to do more specific workshops for certain things and still like communicate with a lot of people I guess which was yeah. something that was a lot uh easier to do when we were like on the road around London getting to meet lots of people but you know we've had I guess doing stuff online means we've been able to do kind of panel talks and things like that where we can kind of talk to a lot of people and bring in people from different parts of the country who can join us on our like Zoom mm. workshops and we've like had international attendees so it's kind of grown more in that way Brilliant. um and yeah just kind of adapting and finding new ways to do things can always be like a good thing in some ways <laughs> like obviously we've had to change but I think it really helped us to like focus on you know creating like the library of techniques and stuff for people to work from um which people can go to at any time and just like finding ways that we can still kind of help people at home yeah 
fabulous. I'm just wait, seeing if Sarah wants to come in. We've got this double. We've yeah. got so many layers of tech. <laughs> in those days, uh, just kind of practical reason that uh, me and Ellen both work full time. So just, you know, practical that I might be, you know, I still do PA work, so I might be doing a bit of that. But then at lunchtime, you know, literally, like, there's my sewing machine and there's my computer. So, you know, it's like, oh, it's my lunch hour. I can just do, I mean, it's so amazing what you can get done in an hour. Or I might do a quick video, you know, like we said, to put on our blog. Um, yeah. So just having, just doing that and not kind of being somewhere else, you actually, you know, at home with your with your equipment, um, that's made yeah. a big difference. So kind of, or I'm not, you know, travelling for an hour to and from work. So, you know, it means, like, you can use that time. And obviously being this summer, you've got the daylight in the evening. So just practical stuff like that has really helped. Yeah, yeah. And do you, like, do you seek for things to mend? Because I guess things break as and when they break. But yeah. is mending something that it isn't just a need necessarily, but, like, a want that you're just, like, if, if you see something or you're in a charity shop, you mentioned charity shops. I love a good charity shop. Yeah. Um, do you, you know, if you see something that needed mending, it wouldn't be a hindrance to you. Be like, oh, that's fine. I, I think I can, you know fix it and make it work yeah I think I think that the challenge of it is kind of exciting now <laughs> <laughs> like the level of how much it's fallen apart like I definitely especially is like once people know you're like do a lot of repair and stuff like that then they just like offer you up their stuff to like could you fix this and all this stuff <laughs> and like your friends and family and everything and it's like <laughs> you just take on more and more stuff like it's a never-ending mending pile to be fair so <laughs> But it's kind of good. You get a good variety, I think. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm guilty of doing that. And I'm, I'm the same with you with Ella. But her, one, someone in our class, she says, um, she's French and she said, um, she said, well, I'm never on my own agenda. It was such a good way of putting it because she was always coming to class with her husband's bit. And I have to say, I have got, I have had, um, taught my husband, he's been mending, he packed his own jeans. And, but, um, but I, you know, I suppose I'm a bit quicker, so I'll end up doing it but with me it's I end up buying two things I really like that I know are too small so for me then it's a challenge of how can I alter them so that they can they do fit mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of I've got about three projects on the go at the minute making things bigger which is yeah. much more making them smaller yeah and I think what you're saying about like um encouraging people to have a play around with stuff is really important as well because I can speak from, like, dressmaking scares me a lot. <laughs> you know, looking at a pattern, it's very daunting. <laughs> and I did um, make a top over lockdown, but it's not it's not perfect. And I messed up the sort of the armholes and whatever, because I cut the pattern thinking that that would be fine without measuring it properly or something. And um, at the time, you thought of like, oh, no, I haven't, you know, I haven't done it right. There's like this focus on doing things the right way. Um, but in the end, it's sort of like it, it hasn't fallen apart and it, I think it looks good. So I think that's more important than necessarily doing it correctly. Um, and I think this, yeah, this idea of playing with things and having fun with it is really important. And Sarah, you mentioned, you know, growing up, you would want, like, you know, take your mum's clothes and make it into a, a bag as well and like I used to do stuff like that as well and customize clothes and it's just sort of like this important aspect to it I think and not get too bogged down in the in the nitty-gritty of like oh am I doing it right am I not doing it right um so in terms of mending what is your what are your favorite ways to play with mending and like what's your what's your fa there's lots of ways to mend I suppose and we can go into that in a bit more detail just the logistics of it but for you what what do you enjoy most about it what is sort of like the most playful aspect of it for you um I guess for me because I, I guess coming more from like a stitch and like embroidery kind of background I like the visible mending side of it is kind of what I probably mostly do now and I find like the most exciting to do because it kind of you're mending but you're also kind of adding like decoration to what you're mending um mm -hmm. and you can really like play around with like adding in new colors to what you've got and like things like that and just kind of changing 
what you already owned and what you kind of like if it's your clothing like something you might have loved for ages but like it's got to the end of its life or whatever in yeah. something new and still being able to kind of carry not have to like put it in the bin but you know it's something new that you're like changing yourself and I think I find that quite exciting in terms of just like your wardrobe could always change even though you've got the same stuff in it for like 20 years <laughs> yeah yeah the same I think um uh Eleanor taught me to darn and so now everything gets done like my nan she's to darn everything and um but I really like the process of darning um because it because if I do do dressmaking it does tend to be on the machine a little bit more not so rushed but a lot more speedy um or even if I, I don't know, to take up some trousers or something. Whereas it is the kind of thoughtful process when you're done it. Um, and I, I was kind of more on the invisible mending. So I'm, in, I'm trying to embrace the visible mending and using different colours um, for my darnings. This year's I've kind of got a bit more practice with it. Um, so, yeah, I think it, I think it is really nice that to be able to uh, preserve like your favourite clothes and it's definitely a thing that comes when we do our physical workshops that people come with something they just they're really attached to mm. they have a story behind it or just something they just love wearing and it's really nice to help them be able to mend it um, and then they can carry on wearing it or turn in something else but usually it's usually just mending rather than turning something else yeah yeah no I'm I'm the same as you Sarah I'd sort of um, I sort of was thinking as you were talking about it, it was like, oh yeah, I could have done, you know, I could do this in a different colour, but I've gone for black because I guess it's sort of ingrained in us that it's like if something is broken, you have to mm. put it back together again the way that it was because otherwise it's not the same piece of clothing or something. But then, you know, there's nothing bad with that. And I think, Eleanor, what you were saying of like, that you, through this process, your wardrobe can always change because, you know, people will think that, or you know you inherently think of yeah if I buy new clothes my wardrobe will will change but actually just by simply mending a hole with a different color thread you've made something new which I think is really special so we've already spoken for half an hour time goes so quickly Why? I know <laughs> <laughs> so um because Instagram kicks people off after an hour, so I don't, I don't want that to happen. So it would be great if we could start talking about, yeah, talking more about mending and um, the different types of mending that you teach and it's possible for people to do. And um, then we can, yeah, maybe focus on a couple of bits. And I've, I've said, as I've, I've got my sock here, but yeah, um, we could st start on the more practical practical bits now if that's going to work yeah sure yeah i'm going to have to reconfigure the camera <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know yeah or maybe i'll just lift it up at first so i've got a couple of examples of where we uh the kind of classic techniques that we end up teaching which yeah. is um darning and patching so i've got a couple of examples of this is like the visible men's style um mm. So this is on a pair of slippers that basically yeah. they were totally moth eaten. So everywhere that there's like a bit of colour, that is a darn that I've done to fix the many, many holes in them. Wow. Um, so yeah, they were originally totally grey and then the darnings kind of added a whole extra thing to them. Yeah. Um so that's yeah, the like visible men's style and just using like the simplest darning technique that there is. So I and that and that really shows as well, like how because that looks like it. They were really mothy, and you know, <laughs> I, I think you know. But some people would just be like, "Oh, they're beyond repair," you know, and this sort of idea of being beyond repair as well. Yeah. Um, and that just shows that it's like actually you can really bring something back from, you know, being quote unquote beyond repair. Yeah. Uh, with with darning and mending. Yeah, definitely. I think it's. It is obviously just a bit down to time. How much, like, how much? <laughs> how um, desperately yeah. do you need those slippers <laughs> yeah. right now? Yeah, I yeah. Know. It's like how urgent are they? Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I've repaired a jacket before that was just, like really, like in a way, should have been in the bin. Like it was literally falling apart completely. Like it was made of like faux leather, but it had all like peeled off, and so it was like flaking the whole thing. And it was just like I don't. Someone gave it into a charity shop, and I got it out of the like rag bag at the back. <laughs> and like, luckily I was doing it when I was studying so I had a bit more time but yeah I managed to turn that into like a usable jacket so it's like 
I don't well, that's incredible. Need to be on repair. You just got to have yeah a little bit. How of time did you do it. that? How did you do that if it was all peeling off? Like, did you? How would you repair that? So I did. It's no longer faux leather. It's more like a patch jacket. So it's fully covered okay. in patches and like Sissiko kind of t- stitching. So oh, yeah, okay, kind of yeah, changing yeah. you. But yeah, the base of the jacket is there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so then I've just got another couple little samples of the which, uh, patching technique that we show a lot of the time at our workshops, which I don't know if, sorry, the lighting's not great. Oh yeah, one. no, I can see it now, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so that's actually like a white on white one, but it's basically the kind of borrow inspired patching, which is like a Japanese technique. So you use this running stitch to go all the way across the patch. Um, and this is like oh. contrasting patch and thread um but that just makes it kind of uh stay in the fabric more i'd say so it's a bit stronger basically like that than just going around the edge of the hole so you can see like mm-hmm. the little okay. size of the hole is only little uh yeah, you yeah, build yeah. up a lot of stitching around it um yeah. and you can just kind of keep doing that on like it gets used a lot on pairs of jeans and things like that mm. um because they kind of yeah your jeans will rip in the like the thigh and stuff like that a lot and you can just keep adding it basically for as long as you can you feel like it <laughs> yeah yeah um and then yeah i don't know is there any other techniques you think so <laughs> you can show <laughs> so you might have to just move your pc a bit and then i'm not sure <laughs> that's it um well one that's kind of so you mentioned about um like the patching and one thing that happens a lot is when um especially your jeans that they go in the thighs um so here these this is actually a pair of shorts but um i think you can just see it a little bit easier than jeans <laughs> but literally they've got a patch on the inside so it's a fabric on the inside with this mm-hmm. one i did it on the sewing machine so sometimes i'll use the technique that ellen has showed um, yep. with hand stitching if you do want to do it quickly um so that's the, the sewing machine oh great and you can get denim colored thread as well so sometimes like if it is in um in the side you don't particularly want to show it um, <laughs> this is uh this is a pedding but this is done by hand this one so you, you can see it's a bit more subtle if you use the same color yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a big. That's it. I mean, whenever you like your hem jeans or anything like that, or they really are past repair, it, it's really important to keep the denim because it's so good to use the patching. So you can see that's the, the big patch that's going on the inside. Yeah. Um, well, that's a really good point, and then actually. Just a, about... bit, a bit more decorative. Yeah. Um, here's a pair of jeans that, you know, like Ellen's like shown, I've just use different colours and patches just then it's more visible yeah I mean these are, these are a sample that we use in the workshops people to practice on so you can see it's a sort of one in progress but I don't think it's going to kind of so good or not um so yeah right. just really kind of playing around with it um, yeah and just enjoying it really and just seeing what you can come up with yeah I think that's a really good point as well about like as you say keeping jeans or keep keeping things to use as their material um you know if not necessarily that they need mending or so or whatever or maybe you've made jeans into jean shorts or whatever and you've got the spare fabric or whatever it is <laughs> and you, and I, yeah. I, I, I do embroidery and I, I actually i've been thinking how do i make it less wasteful because you always have like the offcuts of of fabric and things like that and I've seen people make sort of door stops out of, you know, that's just stuffed all with their their remains of their fabric and, and these genius things. So I think that's a really good point, actually, about just keeping fabric um, to use for patches and things like that. Would you say, yeah, jeans and like thicker material is what you would what you would need for a patch or just depends on what you're patching, I suppose? Yeah, it's really good to try and match the fabric. So, you know, if I was catching this T-shirt, I would try and get a piece of stretchy jersey. Um, but um, with jeans, I mean, some of them I might use um, some patterned cotton so that, you know, it's a bit more decorative. But, again, you still want something quite thick. You don't want, you know, you won't want to 
um, you still, because the two fabrics are going to just pull against each other and they won't last very long. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so if your denim is really good to kind of just, and also denim all different colours. So if you've got lots of different patches, you know, if you are trying to patch say, the inside of your thighs that you don't particularly want to show, yeah. you know, you're trying to match it up a bit. Um, but it's a really good point about all your the odds and ends. I, I basically keep a box um, with just kind of scraps and, you know, might just be cotton threads or, or tiny bits of fabric that I can't use for anything else. And then, yeah, I usually make cushions out of them. Um, um, I, think, I think that's probably all I've done at the minute with the cushions, but it, it does make a really good filler. Yeah. You, can, you know, literally you can use every bit. And um, in Broidy Thread, there's um, someone else at the Create Place, one of the other tutors, uh, Mealy, she's a Mealy Bright Designs. She, I think she collects the small bits and she's um, doing some felting with it. I think, well, I think that was on one of her classes and one of the women started to do some, you know, like if you've got that tool to do felting. Yeah. Um, again, it's something that we, we got just before lockdown. We got some of the equipment, but then we... You know, we didn't end up going out to use it, but it's something we want to explore with like the odds ends of the yarn that you might use for darning, so you can yeah. get to use every piece of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, because that's something that I struggle with as well, and I've I've tried to do sort of like not free embroidery, so you don't actually, you know, you don't have the little tail at the end because it seems like nothing, but actually, it is something and it adds up. Um, so that's really that's really interesting actually. And um, okay, so should we do some mending? Yeah, should we try. Try. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should have got a different colour for my sock. I've got my black with me now, but. Yeah, I went for, uh, I've got some contrasting colours, so hopefully yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I need to break out of my, of my lack of creativity, because I've gone <laughs> black on my oh, sock. No. Oh yeah, do you want to talk through um, as well the um, uh, alternatives to a mushroom? And okay. what even is a darning mushroom? Because uh, I yeah. didn't know. Show you that. Okay, so this is a classic darning mushroom, um, which is like this is actually like a vintage one, so got it off eBay or something like that, I think. Um, so you can get them in a few different shapes. You can also get like darning eggs as well, um, oh. which can kind of be good for. I think they're quite useful for socks and like things which have more of a, a kind of curve to them as well, because it can help make that shape. Um, mm. Basically, all you need is something that you can kind of hold the fabric over of whatever you're mending yeah so it kind of sits on top and you can just like grasp around it like that so there's quite a lot of different things that you can find around your house that you can try out and see if it works um but yeah we did a little blog post about it um over lockdown um mm. yeah that we you were using uh, a few things like a jar was quite good i think like i wonder if i've got it here actually um but yeah if you use like an upside down jar that works quite well this is actually filled with off cuts so that's <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah and you can kind of just wrap around it like that or yeah like you're using the pestle from a pestle and mortar i thought that was worked quite well because it's already made to be kind of held um so it's kind of anything that you can just like grab your hand around <laughs> and stretch the fabric yeah. around a little bit and it just keeps it in place when you're working on it so that it um you don't like close up the hole or make it uh kind of stretch too much it just keeps it kind of even as you're working on it yeah so i can start off a little darn here just to like show it as we're chatting um, yeah please do because i started doing mine um last night because Fast Fashion Therapy have a, it's a weekly, isn't it? On Monday, you've got your weekly um, it's Fast Fashion Therapy a, at home. Twice a <laughs> month, actually. So it's like every, almost every other Monday. But yeah, it's the second and fourth Monday, normally. Yeah, so I joined last night and I started doing my sock, but I'm not sure, if, not sure I'm doing it right. But, um, but I guess, because this is on, um, is it important where where the hole is in terms of how much slack you need to give the darn so like this is on the back of my heel which yeah. will be um which will have been worn down because it's been rubbing against stuff but it's also like it will have been stretched out i suppose do you need to do i need to give 
more sort of a stretch when I'm darning so that when I release it and when I wear it, it can stretch over my foot. Like, does that, does that make a difference? Um, I guess you want to be like extra careful there of kind of like not closing up the hole at all when you're doing it. So like yeah. make sure you keep it quite even as you're like stitching into it. Yeah. But I don't think you want to, yeah, give it, you don't want it to be looser because that's, it's kind of like the tightness of it is what kind of holds the structure together. So okay. I'd say that will kind of make it stronger and like it'll give it more wear if you have, if it's kind of quite tightly packed in as a darn. Mm. Um, I know there's a different technique where you can do it like this kind of, uh, the classic technique is like go horizontal up and down and then vertical. Wait, mm -hmm. no, around. but yeah, that. <laughs> um, and, but you can do it so that the second uh, lot of kind of um, stitching in is actually on the diagonal and that's meant to give it a bit of a stretch. Um, oh, like yes. Another way of kind of like fitting in with knitted clothing a bit more, I think. Mm -hmm. I think so, um, Ellen, I might have got this wrong, but if, um, as you're stretching it over the mushroom or whatever you've got, that is going to kind of create that shape as well. Like, so, because I've got quite a few tights on the heel that needs to repair it. I think just the fact that you're stretching them around that round shape you're not doing it flat i think that helps also to create that shape yeah because would you yeah i guess you because you wouldn't use like an embroidery hoop to fix something i suppose you'd need that sort of surface to lie it on is that right um so i have actually used an embroidery hoop before but i guess it's got to be on more of like a woven fabric so like a cotton or something like that where you're not going to kind of stretch it out too much it can only mm -hmm. stretch it out a little bit um yeah. But yeah, I'd say it does kind of help having the kind of surface underneath when you're kind of doing like the weaving in and out so that you've got something to kind of like, uh, I guess, like pick up the rows against. It kind of helps you to like pick them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you, well, you talk this through, I guess my, my confusion is always like casting off as well with, um, with things like this, because obviously you don't want to knot it. <laughs> yeah they have knots everywhere especially on your sock that's not gonna be very com comfortable um yeah so i tend when i'm darning to like i don't um do a knot i just do when i'm starting off with a new bit of yarn or thread just do like two stitches on the same spot kind of thing just to mm -hmm. like cure it and then you can just cut down the tail so that it's like that and then just that that should keep it in but when you're working on that wool because it'll kind of as you wear it and wash it the fibers will like naturally map together anyway so you don't yeah. need to use a yeah like a knot or something to secure it in the same way yeah and so it's just a process of literally weaving in and out is that right yeah yeah so basically and you need and you start sort of like yeah, you don't start on the hole. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that. it's kind of best to do a couple of like, uh, rows of stitching just going into the side of the hole um, yeah. just to kind of secure your yarn into the fabric. And also, I think to stop the hole from like growing any bigger when after you've like finished working on it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you just want to keep your rows fairly close together and like going back and forth like that and to try yeah. and keep little loops at the end of each row. So I don't know if you can see that like, I can, that's a row and I can just like fit my needle through it still. Um, and that just gives a little bit of space when you wash it um, because the yarn is kind of new and the, whatever you're working on, like the jumper or whatever is old, um, the yarn might shrink more than the jumper and then that will just uh. stop it from like shrinking and like pulling it in and making it kind of whoosh up. Yeah. Good tip. And the other thing that kind of helps with like the overall finish of the darn is to like work from the back of whatever you're working on. So this jump is kind of turned inside out and then that uh, means okay. that the, like the messier side of the darn is inside. Well, I haven't done that with my sock, but never mind. <laughs> <It'll be okay. laughs> yeah. To be fair, I did it like the slippers that I showed, that was all from the the front as well so it's you probably can like get away with it and no one will notice but <laughs> just the the traditional technique and do people just normally bring clothes to your workshops or do they bring like 
sort of any sort of fabric thing like yeah cushions or bedding blankets things like that or is it usually clothes that people bring yeah we've had um a guy um fix this sheet um he patched we to patch it um i was i think we've had like shoes purses um bags I mean, you know there's some sometimes you, we've got some leather needles so that if someone does want to make some leather i think some books and shoes they were difficult because you need to have like specialist tools you know because the leather's so thick but um yeah but yeah i mean we we try whatever we can really where people bring and sometimes someone might just have like a nice piece of fabric they want to use and um i've got like a little booklet where i've created some patterns to make just some small bags so that you know you can use up the fabric so they might i don't know have a pillowcase they really like the print on or something like that um and then yeah, we teach them to, to make things with it. Well, the, um, I don't know if you're the case where you are, but uh, the Create Place get a lot of donations. So they had, so it's there, like there was a shirt company and I think they literally had just the, the cup of, the, half a sleeve in the cup. Uh, but it was like really nice shirt and fabric. So it meant that, um, you know, everyone could use that. And it was amazing how much fabric you get out of it for patching. Yeah. And yeah, do people donate stuff to you a lot? Is that how did you get like the equipment that you have and stuff? It's amazing that you you have that for people to use and stuff. Yeah, yeah I think. The, oh, sorry, Emma, you go. No, you go. <laughs> well, as I was saying, I think um, the create place has kind of um, been established for a few years now. So, um, and I think where it's in Bethnal you know, near Shoreditch, there's quite a lot of design studios around there. So they're, they're lucky that they're in a good position for that. Um, and then, but we did get people contacting us and say they, you know, they work in a showroom and they've got swap jeans. Um, and it's great because then it means we can, you know, you've got a variety. Because sometimes what's difficult is someone might come with like their favourite top. And, um, you know, the kind of the, the fashions today, it'd be like quite a thin vest goes. And, and it's actually difficult to buy that fabric. Like, you, if you go to a haberdashery shop, you wouldn't necessarily buy the fabric you can buy on walls. doesn't represent the fabric that's actually out there in the shops. So at least, you know, by getting these kind of samples from retail companies, it's a bit more representative of what people bring in to me. Yeah. And then you can usually find something that hasn't got a matching colour, but, you know, like I was talking about the textures trying to match. You know, so if you if you have got, you know, this goes is a really popular fabric with dresses and shirts and trousers. Um, so at least then you might be able to find some some this guys that will work to patch it. Yeah. And where do you both I guess well, Eleanor, you're Stratum and then um Sarah, you're East, but do you have sort of favourite places to when you do need to buy stuff like your you know needles and your threads and things like that do you because i try and not order stuff online i try and actually buy things from you know haberdasheries and things like that do you have any preferred places you'd like to go or anywhere you can recommend um yes <laughs> there's there's a few this is a bit far but it's definitely worth the trip there's this place in um it's literally one stop from Norwich, so it's a bit far from London. But um, it just, it just so happened I was on holiday there. It's a little town called Wyndham, and it's literally one stop from Norwich. And really close to the station is this most amazing warehouse. It's a charity shop called The Big C. Um, I think it's got a Facebook page, you can look it up. And they, it, it's basically a warehouse just full of. Um, vintage patterns, fabrics, zips, and someone has painstakingly gone in and put everything in a little neat basket. So you can just, you know, you're not like rummaging, you're like, oh, I need a zip this thing, and someone's bothered to put it in a certain basket. It honestly, it was amazing. It's definitely just worth the trip for that. That's amazing. Basically, I just go to child shops, and if you just go around to the back in, you know, where they might have some, like, old plates and things like that, then you can always, there's always a little basket and you might just find a few embroidery threads or I found dining mushroom. 
it, it's just it literally takes a few minutes to just walk to the back have a look nothing walk out but um it's amazing what you can find yeah yeah i'd say like charity shops have become my main source as well really like just yeah especially around streatham there is a lot of them um, there are yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have a favorite one um yeah well the one that's like closest to me is called like give a little and that uh-huh. i found some really good uh like massive reels of yarn and stuff in there and it's been like a pound and it's literally kept me going for years um so yeah, I think there's an extra kind of thrill in finding it in a charity shop and realizing you can use it. Um, Definitely. But yeah, I like especially with like yarn stuff. Still try and get a lot of stuff uh, secondhand, like online as well. Like I found like Gumtree has been really good for finding, you know, so many really? people. Yeah, who do like uh, projects or something, and they don't need their embroidery threads or yarns or yeah, just like fabrics as well, and we'll like sell it off in a big like job lot for not that much and it's like a really good way of finding like a lot of different stuff I think on there as well yeah yeah eBay's the same I mean um, if you say you've got a button you want to match it's really tricky to find eBay's got loads and loads of buttons Um, I've managed to get a job lot of zips that were kind of I think I think it was a factory that just found a load and it was just a few quid and I've got a massive bag of zips and yeah, eBay's good for that that too. And I think yeah. I use Facebook Marketplace, but my friend sent me um, a link to a load of vintage patterns the other day. So I don't know if it, you know if that might be good. I haven't used it myself. Yeah, yeah, I love a good I love a good eBay secondhand eBay job lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to um, uh, I was in Cornwall a couple of weeks ago, and in Saint Also they have this big sort of um, very strange shopping center sort of thing <laughs> or like it's almost like an indoor market but um they have a few uh yarn stalls and sort of like haberdashery stalls and they had this basket full of um like reduced you know embroidery threads the skeins and they had loads of red because i found red has been so hard to get hold of in in my local you know haberdashers here so I just went to town. <laughs> <laughs> just I was that. like, yes, yes, I'll have all <laughs> And yeah. then I thought... and there's, a, there's a really good um, vintage shop I should mention in Whipstable in Kent. Um, they're called Anchors Away, that as in um, A-W-E-I-G-H, I think. Um, and they they have loads of um, haberdashery and fabric, but... Even though they're in Whitstable, if you follow them on Instagram, they will, um, as a lovely lady called Sally runs it, she will post it. So I've, I've got quite a lot of um, mushrooms from her. And she does like a little pack of threads. Um, so you'll just get, you know, for like a few quid, you'll just get a bag for the different coloured threads. Wow. Um, so it's definitely worth following them on um, Instagram. She has some like, really good stuff. Yeah, I will do. And I'll, I'll tag them, I'll find them and tag them in the in the comments once, once this is posted oh, as well that'd be nice. like yeah. yeah wow i'm getting i'm getting somewhere with mine oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah looks good very neat thanks <laughs> <laughs> well i'm aware of the time instagram's gonna chuck us off in five minutes so i don't want that <laughs> um eleanor do you want to just talk us through what you're doing now, I see you, you're so speedy because you practice so much. You're on the um, yeah on the other way now to, to sort of secure it, right? Yeah, sort exactly. of weaving in and out. So yeah, so it's kind of just a process of like weaving in and out of the yarns that you did going in that direction. Wait, yeah, that direction. Um, so I'm kind of like halfway through here, and so I've done a few rows. So don't know how well you can see it, but basically yeah, yeah. You need to alternate um, which ones you're going under and over on each row um so this one yeah is the next so like on the last one here i was under it so now i'm gonna go over that and then under the next one um and yeah you just keep doing that all the way across the hole and um just to keep it kind of like close together and kind of a quite a tight weave or sorry pulled my yarn out my thread um (laughs) yeah you can kind of use your needle um just to push it down and push the rows closer together mm-hmm. so 
I'll do this one across and then I can show you what I mean. Um, so this is definitely the fiddlier bit of darning where you need to like catch your rows. But also if you do just like accidentally pick up two or whatever, it just means it's like a bit more of an uneven structure, but it doesn't mean that it will like fall apart. So it can still work as like a way of mending. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just to keep them close together, you can kind of use your needle just to push them down and like compact them in a bit. Yeah. And that just gives a bit of a tighter darn and it should be kind of stronger when you're wearing it as well. Yeah. And this just shows as well, like, you know, once you've practiced, you can do it, you can do it super quick. It's not something that's necessarily going to take you days. Yeah, to do. yeah, I think it is as well. Like when it's something that you can do hands, so you can kind of do it like in front of the TV or whatever, or when you're like, just, I don't know, like sitting around your family or something. Yeah. And it doesn't end up having to like, yeah, be like a really big job. It yeah, just or on public like, transport. Like, That's what me and Emily were talking about. We were like, yeah. we to normalise craft on public transport. Yeah, so I love. Exactly. You, you still think it's weird, don't you? If you see a lady knitting on the train, you're like, oh, it stands out. But it's a perfect time to knit. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. do your darning on the on the tube when we and finally you can go back on the tube. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you can just like wear it as soon as you get off the tube and you're ready to go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> And you sell mending kits, don't you, on your website? Yeah, we do. So we've got um, a few different kits, but basically a darning one and a patching one. So in the darning one, you get like five different colours of thread. And we've got like a few different um, combinations of that. And then your needles and then a little um, kind of card showing you how to darn with some like, diagrams. And then the patching one, you get a bundle of different kinds of fabric and patches and your needles and the same thing with like a little card of how to do it so uh, yeah they're available on our website great well i'll put links and stuff in the in the comments and stuff on the igtv i have a countdown i've got one minute 37 remaining on my instagram countdown <laughs> we've nearly taken up the whole hour it's been fabulous yeah thank you both so much for joining and showing us your amazing <laughs> skills thank you yeah yeah and um thank you so much i've really enjoyed it and i'll tag all of all well I'll post all of your website and things like that what have you got coming up that people can join anything yeah we'll have another workshop um either online or in person in a couple of weeks time um Good. and then yeah those are our monday evening ones will carry on every second and fourth monday of the month so yeah there'll be once you're on our website there'll be updates on whether that's in person or online great well yeah, we're really have to... trying to build up more of our blog library as well that's kind of on our to-do list yeah fabulous well thank you both so much i've had a great time and my socks you know getting there and i hope people joining have had fun as well thank you for all so much for listening um 30 seconds oh okay sorry <laughs> thanks much. for having us <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much it's been, it's been lovely thank you and i hope i hope to see you both at a physical workshop soon as well and i yeah i'll keep joining online but yeah thank you all for joining thank you fast fashion therapy and we'll see you next time thank you everyone bye, thank you. bye. bye.